I realized in kindergarten, uh, the first time I really, you know, me personally experiencing my temper go off. And of course I was too young to realize, you know, I had a temper problem, an anger problem. In the ninth grade, I was in a private school, a uh, Baptist private school. I'd been there for a few years and I got kicked out for getting into a fight with the pastor and the superintendent, school superintendent's son. So I got kicked out and I was homeschooled again for the second time. And I knew then that I had the fire. I had always, I'd always looked up to uh, my friends that were older than me and that they had all gone into the Marine Corps. And uh, so, I mean, I knew I was going to military. Uh, it was either that or do construction. At the point that he joined the military, I felt that was a good fit for him. He was always had leadership capabilities. When we would walk on a trail, he was always the leader at the head of the trail. I felt that at that point in his life, that was, it was a good thing, that it would be good for him. My military background, uh, I thought it'd be great for our son to try and go into the military. He wanted to be in the Army. Of course, I was in the Air Force, but he wanted to do something with his hands. He wanted to be part, he wanted to get his hands dirty. It's like, you know, hey, this is what I was made for. I was made for combat. I was made to be a ranger. The first day of Ranger indoctrination was September 11th, 2001. CNN was on, and both the towers were smoking. And I felt the rush, and I knew that the reason I had joined the military was coming true. That was re really the pivotal point in it all, I believe. We began training uh, to jump into um, Saddam International Airport in like uh, February of 2003, right when we came back from Afghanistan. So we knew, I mean, we knew that, you know, something was going on, something's gonna happen. We knew we were gonna go to war. And the reason that we had finally flown in country into Iraq was to go rescue Jessica Lynch. Uh, the second, I was, you know, the main objective was Jessica Lynch, and then the other one was recover the bodies of her military brothers and sisters in her unit that had been killed. I believe it was third platoon moved to the morgue, and there was no bodies there. And we literally had brought body bags, and that's it. Well, we're, we're, we're like, okay, we're, we're looking for these bodies. Where are they at? So we started, they had, they had interpreters, and, and the other guys were questioning the doctors uh, up at the front of the hospital, you know, where's the bodies at? And uh, the doctor said, well, we buried them, you know, several days ago. We moved around the front of the hospital, and, and one of the graves had already been opened by some, some guys from 3rd Platoon. And the smell was just, as long as I live, there will never be nothing that compares to the smell uh, that hit me when I came around that hospital wall. And uh, we knew what had to be done. We moved over to the holes, we dropped our gear, a couple guys pulled security, and we began to dig with the only thing we had, our hands. When your brother and sister has been buried for, you know, three or four days, been dead a week, and you start uncovering them, and they're wet and slimy with their own decay, and they're falling apart, they're missing the limbs, it has an effect on you that will stay with you the rest of your life. And, we're rangers, we live the creed. Never leave a fallen comrade, never. And we got down in them holes and we dug. And guys would get out and puke and get right back in. I felt selfish, but the thought entered my mind, thank you God, that's not me. We deployed to Mosul, Iraq, January 2005, and uh, I got the 
the honor and privilege to be the gunner on a pander for Task Force Delta. And believe me, we look up to them guys. They're, you know, the operators, the true operators. Uh, that's what they've always been called. We were doing a day mission, January 28, 2005. Two days before the first time the Iraqis stuck their fingers in the ink and voted for the first time. So there was a curfew and absolutely no cars were allowed on the road. Um, and that was because of threats of IEDs uh, or you know car bombs driving up into the voting areas and, and, and exploding and killing people. So we accomplished what we came to do and we turned around and started heading back to our base. I remember looking at my watch. It was 12.05 Zulu. The sun was up, we were cruising down the road. I would say we were going as fast as we could go, which is about 45 miles an hour. And we came up to an intersection and our convoy was going from west, from, from east to west. And we were the lead vehicle. Now, off to my left, all the houses were built directly up to the curb. We had come to an intersection and them houses being up on the curb you literally could not see the other highway that was going from south to north. But there was a flicker between the buildings. And I remember, I said, strike her left, strike her left, strike her left. I hit my comms, strike her left, strike her left. And I kept screaming until I ran out of air. As we came up to the intersection, probably with, in the last 0.5 second, Sergeant First Class Mickey's on the operator that was driving driving the pander cut to the right. As he cut to the right, the pander T-boned us into the left side, right into where Mickey was driving. And upon impact, I was ejected. He was killed on impact, and I knew it. I knew it as I was flying through the air. This situation with Sergeant First Class on is another situation where like digging the bodies out in Nazaria. It'll never leave me. It kind of boils down to the injury he sustained on the knee wasn't life-threatening, but the internal injury of the mental anguish of losing Mickey Zahn it continued to haunt him, and it followed him every day. And so he described it to me once as like a black shadow that he would turn and he would see a shadow or something black behind him. I was left with a messed up knee, um, guilt from the, you know, wondering if I made the right decision, someone died, did I make the right decision? You know what I mean? An operator, a man better than me, died. That, not being able to train, you know, knee surgery, I did, I went straight to alcohol, hardcore. And from February to May, that's what I did. I drank and drank and drank. But uh, the whole time, uh, through all this, my common denominator of support was Tanya. May 7th, uh, we went to a chow wagon, me and Tanya and some of her friends. And after that, we returned to a party. She decided to ride with her friend back to the house because I was too drunk. Good choice. Um, I got mad. And about the time I got mad about that, I realized that back at that party were some frat boys from a college. The same college as a guy who had taken advantage of my beautiful sweetheart a, you know, a few years prior when we weren't together. And in my alcoholic rage, uh, PTSD fit, not knowing even if that was one of the guys over there, I turned around, got back in my car, got on the main road, or the road right off the driveway, floored the Lincoln LSBA. And, uh, there was a hill, and as I came over that hill, I kind of went airborne, and I went left, 
and there was a tree there. When I saw the tree, I cut it back right, and there was a little concrete, about six inches of concrete, and my right front tire, or left front tire, hit that concrete and flipped. I did not have my seatbelt on, and as a result, I was ejected out the back window. And all I remember is trying to breathe. And I remember the, the, the ribs that had broke off into my lungs and the pain and the trying, just like, you know, just trying to breathe. It was, it was hell. And, uh, you know, passing in and out. And, you know, the firefighters get there, the EMT. And I'll never forget the officer. He wasn't a very nice guy. Uh, he's seen all the beer bottles uh, that had been in the back seat or beer cans that had been in the, uh, in the trunk that had flung, and they had been flung everywhere. So he didn't even leave the road. He just stood on the side of the road and never even came and checked on me. He just stood there. So bless his heart. I woke up, you know, several days later after having a uh, neck fusion because of my broken neck. And when I woke up, I was paralyzed from the chest down. And uh, I have been ever since. We got the call about 2.30 in the morning, and it's the call that no mother wants to receive, no father wants to receive. We dressed as quickly as we could and got to Louisville, which is like eight hours away by, I believe it was 10 or 11 o'clock that morning. Our first sight of our son was, he was in a collar. He was on the emergency room gurney. He was covered with rocks and blood and that was the beginning of our journey into um, a, a, different, a different life. So I'm in the University of Louisville for a month. My mother-in-law and my mom came up to me and, and they knew that me and Tanya, you know, were eventually gonna get married. Uh, we, they knew that we loved each other. They're like, you know, you know we, we think you should all get married. And uh, I was, absolutely. So we were married, University of Louisville Trauma Center, intensive care, May 23rd of 2005. And uh, after spending a month at, the, at, at Louisville, uh, I was transferred to the VA in Chicago, the Heinz VA in Chicago. And that's when the horror began. I couldn't get off the ventilator. And the reason I couldn't get off the ventilator is because I had a hole in my esophagus that they didn't know about. I had pneumonia, they did not know that either. They sent me to a specialized clinic to get off the uh, ventilator. During that time, they did not turn me, so I developed a pressure sore. That pressure sore became so bad that it ate through my femur and disconnected my femur from my pelvis, and it's still that way today. So I come back to the VA and they do a series over the next uh, year um, of 13 surgeries trying to fix that hole, none of which were successful. In that time, I went for a period of three months with an indwelling catheter in my penis, and it was never removed or cleaned. And to this day, them not doing that, it took, you know, a normal looking penis and it twisted it over to where it's pointing over here. That's the kind of neglect that happened to me. During this whole course of, of debacles with his treatment and care. Um, he was taken to one surgery and I believe it was when the, the muscle was put up into the throat, into the, the neck to try to repair the hole, that when we came, were finally allowed to see him, he was in an ICU unit. They could not regulate the heat. It was very hot in there. And um, he was laying on a pillow that had blood on it from the seepage in his neck. And be, due to the heat, it smelled. It, it smelled like blood. And we, we asked for the, the pillowcase to be changed, but people were too busy. And he laid that way for hours. The heat was terrible. I mean, these are only just a few instances of what he had to put up with in a US hospital. We're not talking about PTSD overseas because of military duty. We're talking about you should be safe in the, in the United States, in a, in a military or a, or a VA hospital, you should be safe. 
And during the whole time in the VA, he was never given physical therapy because of all the surgeries on the throat. He was never well enough to have physical therapy for his neck injury. One time they were wheeling him out of the, the spinal cord unit and wheeling him to the main hospital. And the guy that wheeled him out lost control of the cart and Chris started rolling down the embankment by himself with people watching. Here he is, he's a spinal cord patient. He can't get up and help himself and he's literally rolling down the embankment. This whole time, not only am I going through this, my wife, now Tanya, had moved to Chicago and every day she was coming in, you know, she lived by herself in a one room bedroom apartment, one bedroom apartment, and she would come in and help take care of me every day. Because the care was so horrible, I would have literally died if she hadn't have been. December 1st of 2006, after 19 months of hell, I finally went home. And as soon as I went home, I turned to alcohol. And I started abusing my pain medication. And I started verbally abusing my wife. And this went on for eight years. And we tried counseling. We tried different things. But I never put forth the correct effort, the right effort to get help. I literally would take any form of speed over the counter I could find. You know, you take your speed, you take your drugs, you watch porn, you go play computer, you know, it enhanced the feeling in my body, even though I couldn't get a, a release from, with an orgasm, it felt, it felt better. And, and instead of getting help from my PTSD, instead of saving my marriage my, and, and staying with my soulmate, I mean, all I had to give was just a little effort. I mean, she, she loved me, or she wouldn't have stayed with me for eight years. All I had to give was a little effort. But no, instead, I chose drugs. Instead, I, I chose pornography and drowning my problems with drugs and alcohol for eight years. And finally, she left. And I tried numerous times to kill myself. I stuck a gun to my chest. I don't know how many times. I sit with a gun in my truck, I don't know how many times. I would pray, God, give me the strength to kill myself. One day I went out in my garage, and I still have the bullet hole in my truck, in my truck door, and I did a test fire, bam. And my 9mm has two safeties on it. And uh, then I took the 9mm, I pulled the trigger, and I went to push the safety on the back, and nothing happened. So I put it down, I readjusted, and went to do it again. And it was like somebody poured gasoline on me and lit me on fire. And it was like, you don't want to pull that trigger, son. That was right about the time Carl Monger with Gallant Few and Jason Granger, my good friend from Ranger Battalion, started realizing, hey, Chris, you know, he's trying to kill himself. I actually met Jay in 2004. Um, Afghanistan. It was my fourth tour. He's the one that reached out. He said, hey, suck it up. I know how tough you are. Get your ass off the ground and let's go. Come out here to Arizona. I'm gonna take you skydiving because he was, a, 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 you know, at the time an instructor at Halo School at Yuma Proving Grounds. And Jay filmed uh, my first skydive as a quadriplegic. And it was, it was great. It was great spending time with the man I called my big brother. And he affectionately called me little sister or little brother. And he got me on track, you know, because Jay had finally become a family man. You know, he was doing the right thing, taking care of his boys, taking care of his beautiful wife. And he was on track and he was being an example for the other guys, you know, living the right life. And as bad as Jay was before, I knew if Jay could change, then I could. And that's what really opened my eyes. I think the most important thing Jay has ever told me was when uh, I was on my way to Louisville to take care of a little matter of a civilian. 
that uh, just would not stop getting on my nerves. And he, uh, he told me to grow up. He said, you know, you need to leave the old, old life behind. Quit acting like a you know, kid. He said, you need to forgive and float. And I knew what he meant. You know, don't act better. Just rise above the bullshit. Rise above the negativity. Be who you are. Help others. Don't act better than anybody. Just float and forgive. And I started trying to do that in December of last year. And uh, December 27th, I was sitting in a parking lot. I was sitting in the uh, West Lakes parking lot in Stadium, Missouri. And I got a phone call. And uh, it was Brian Parker, a good friend of uh, Jay, like the closest friend of Jay. And the man I call Big Brother to this day. And I knew when I answered the phone, I knew by the tone of his voice why he was calling, and I knew who he was calling about. And he said, something's happened. I said, oh my God. He says, Jay. I said, what's is he all right? He said, no, he's gone. He said, I said, what happened? He said, he had a skydiving accident. I came and the boys were there on the drop zone, seeing everything. I fucking lost it, I lost it. I thought when my wife left that that was the worst day of my life. No, December 27th, 2013 was the worst day of my life. Losing Jay crushed me. But that instilled something into me that he told me, you forgive, you float, and you help others, little brother. And I knew damn well that if Jay, who's now gone, he's gone. I have no choice. I'm not quitting now. I'm gonna help others. It doesn't matter how much it sucks every day, how much pain there is, how much I miss my family. I miss them every day. I miss them every night, okay? I do this fight alone 90% of the time, but I have a man's memory and the power of my brothers, the love that I have for them, and I live for them. We fight on each day, even though we live with broken hearts. Today is the 16th of November, 2014. It's exactly one year um, since me and Jay and uh, Marty jumped at uh, Sedona. I was on drugs and alcohol for, you know, for eight years, self-medicating for, you know, PTSD, five combat tours, um, 19 months in the hospital. And Jay reaching out and helping me uh, and bringing me to the desert, you know, Arizona, Yuma area. Uh, just north of uh, Mexico border. I don't know, I, I found a peace in the desert. It's just you, all your problems, the desert, and God. And uh, you kind of find yourself. If you spend a lot of time by yourself and you face your demons, you're gonna find out what you're made of. You're either gonna break or you're gonna get stronger.
Hi Chris, welcome back. How you feeling man? Good. Miss my brother. And uh, it's good to jump and honor him. Oh. Miss all of them. God bless their sacrifice. 23 veterans commit suicide every day. They get secluded. They feel the rejection of, of the stigma that society has of PTS. Because the stigma against combat PTS is not the same as, as a rape victim or, or that has PTS or a car accident victim that has PTS. We're feared. We're looked at like somebody that's gonna come in there and just, you know, go nuts on everyone. And when you're rejected so many times, and so your family leaves you, and this happens a lot, this divorce rate among veterans is just through the roof. It's, it's horrible. Veterans end up by themselves. They feel there's no hope. They feel that everybody thinks they're weird. Everybody thinks they're crazy. They're humiliated. They're ashamed. They have guilt. And all they've done is give their all to their country. Gallant Few is uh, basically a veterans mentoring program. Uh, they pair uh, combat veterans with combat veterans. Uh, veterans who have already made the transition successfully in civilian life, they pair with a newly transitioning veteran in a support role. We're heading to LA here from Phoenix to check on a ranger buddy of mine uh, who was hurt in a forklift accident. That's what bat boys do. We cover each other um, no matter what. It don't matter how far you are. It don't matter what's going on. You drop what you're doing and go check on your brother. Uh, when someone contacts Gallant Few and they need assistance when they're facing uh, homelessness, suicide, uh, they need a job, what I do is if they're in my area, in the Phoenix area, or anywhere within a couple states, um, I will get to them and I will give them what they need at that point in time to sustain them. His fearlessness and his uh, tenacity is, is an example to uh, so many people. How you doing, brother? Good to see you alive. My name is uh, uh, Richard Loza. I was in third bat, CCO. Um, so I'm, uh, I, was in, I was involved in a work accident where a forklift pretty much crushed me, left me with a shattered, shattered femur. You're a ranger, for one. I know you're not going to get down. And if you do, you're going to be fine because you're a ranger. You're going to suck it up and drive on. And so what do I have to tell my brother to motivate him? If you need me, I'm here. If you, if you need money, if you need anything, you know, we're bat boys. We take care of each other. And the support that I've been getting from my Ranger brothers is, is awesome. Wouldn't, wouldn't be here without them because it's, it's like, it took me by surprise. Everybody was here. Um, I had all my Ranger brothers from California here the next day when, when they heard from the, from the accident. Um, Got Chris over here from freaking Arizona. She's coming over just to freaking drop off some Snickers. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it's just uh, the network that we have is freaking amazing. A little over a year, I've realized that, you know, Jay had to pass. He had to leave so I could stay. And uh, it's not just words when I say the Airborne Ranger in the sky, you know, rides with me and takes care of me. He's been with me the whole time, I can guarantee you that. Uh, no one else has except the one upstairs, NJ, the Airborne Ranger in the sky. And uh, him leaving so I can stay is pretty powerful, and that's why I help others.